Pat with Pat's Two Cents. We are God's Church of Love online. You're helping me celebrate my birthday, which is tomorrow. I'll be 68 years old. But anyway, I'm going to go right into the Word, and then we can all fellowship afterwards. And, uh, and y'all can give me all my cake and ice cream before we get off. Ha, 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 ha. All right. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, I say that to say this. Sometimes with, I love this word, y'all, so forgive me for all my little words. I just think that they're like toys to me. With all of life's vicissitudes, all the changes we go through, all the challenges, the setbacks, the delays, the frustrations, the worries, the fears, the anxieties, the pressure. We have to remember who our mainstay is. We have to remember who our anchor is. Our anchor is the Lord. And he will keep you in perfect peace if you keep your mind stayed on him. So, just to let you know, God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you could ask or think according to the power of that works in us. That's in Ephesians. Now listen. When life starts to press in on you. When light and people start to back you up against the wall. You can call on one name baby. And it will change the whole scenario. What we have to remember is the authority that's in that name. Yolanda Adams sings a song. There is a name that is so precious, a name so wonderful to me. That name is so powerful. That name, in the name of Jesus, there is peace. In the name of Jesus, there is joy. In the name of Jesus, there is unity. In the name of Jesus, there is boldness. In the name of Jesus, there is authority. You being in Jesus and the Spirit of God living in you, you have authority over everything that goes on in your house, on your projects, at your jobs, within per interpersonal relationships, God, if you allow him and invite him in, will be in total control. But the thing we have to be careful about is not giving in to the works of the flesh while we're waiting on God to intervene and to override our emotions. Now, we're going to go to Galatians chapter 5 because I want you to hear what the works of the flesh are <laughs> and this is where we have to be careful because life can cause us to jump out the box you know jack in the box yeah well jack can oftentimes jump out that box when life squeezes too hard. Have you ever squeezed, held a, a tube of toothpaste and you are busy doing something you don't realize you're squeezing on the toothpaste? What comes out? The toothpaste. All over the place. You can make a royal mess. Squeezing too hard. Well see life, Satan will use life to squeeze on us too hard. It'll feel too hard for us. We can handle it but we don't want to deal with it. So what ends up happening, if we do not keep our minds stayed on God, we can create a royal mess ourselves. Now listen, Galatians 5, starting at Galatians 5 
18. Let's go with 15 because I like that scripture. We all need to be reminded of this when we lose our tempers under pressure. But if ye devour, if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Now, you know what I love about that statement right there. You know, I got to throw in Pat's two cents everywhere I can. So that ye cannot do the things ye would. Do you know there are things you can accomplish in life, things you can do in your day, things that you can, can get done that normally are beyond your scope? When you walk in the Spirit, because the Holy Spirit brings you way above and beyond your own limits. But when you walk in the flesh, it puts limits all over you. And there are levels of potential that God has already given you. There's a certain amount of favor and a certain amount of protection and blessing that God has placed on your day, has placed on you. And your mouth can undo all of it. Your attitude can short circuit all that you could accomplish that day. That's why it says, and ye cannot do the things that ye would. If I put it in street terms, according to commentary, Pat's two cents, it would be, you got to be careful working one against another. Because what ends up happening is all the things that you could do with your day, all the things that you could accomplish, all the goals that you have set ahead of you, oh, you ain't gonna, you gonna fall so short of it, it, it'll amaze you. All that you cannot do. You would have been able to do it, but you can't. You would if you could, but you can't, so you ain't, yeah. That's what happens, the difference between walking in the spirit and walking in the flesh. You would if you could, walking in the spirit, in the flesh, but you can't, so you ain't. That tells it right there. All right, let's go down to verse 18. But if ye be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry. Let me stop at idolatry. Let's, let's park Pat's two cents right there at the curb. Idolatry is not only having an idol made by hands and you just sit there and you bow to it and you worship it. No. An idol is anything that takes top priority above God. Let's name some intangible idols. Pride. Self-consciousness, fear of what people think about you, worried about this one, that one, the boss, your husband, your wife being angry with you, mm -hmm. being so intimidated by your own kids that you do not correct them and put limits on them. You do not discipline them because, oh no, if they rise up against me, it'll hurt my feelings, but I'd rather be their friend. So you take the path of least resistance. That's idol worship. When the Bible clearly says beat them, they won't die. Some lessons can only be learned through pain. We're not talking abuse. All right, so moving right along. Let's go to verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, idolatry, which we just covered. Some people with idolatry, money means more to them than their own family. They've got to meet this deadline. They've got to meet this limit. They've got to get to this certain threshold before they can relax. Doesn't matter what's happening inside of your family. 
It doesn't matter if one of your kids has turned to drugs. It doesn't matter if your daughter or son has been raped and they got to deal with that or molested. No, your concern is the almighty dollar bill. And you pay homage to the dollar bill. That's where a lot of you go wrong. All right. Moving right along from idolatry, witchcraft. A lot of Christians, it just blows my mind to see how many Christians actually get caught up in witchcraft. Crystals. New Age. Tarot cards. Ouija boards. Levitation. Casting spells. Uh, magic. Uh, I'm not going to go any further. Consulting with psychic hotlines and mediums. It's all an abomination to God. Moving along from witchcraft to hatred. You know how many born again Christians, let alone unsaved folks, are caught up in hatred. Somebody walks in the room you had a difference with a year ago, 10 years ago, 30 years ago, and y'all can't stomach each other. Father, son, hatred all over the place, bouncing all over the walls. You just can't stomach the other one being in the same room with you. You really think that that's from God. Hmm. Hmm. You think God's going to co-sign with that one? No. Variance, emulation, wrath. That's another one. Wrath and strife. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So I'm not going to get into that heavily. Just letting you know, these are the things that can really cause issues in your life. And they can limit all that you can be, all that you can do, all that you can accomplish. They put limits on you. They basically sabotage everything you're about. Seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Let me hit on drunkenness. This was coming to my mind. And I know God is oftentimes trying to warn people about stuff like this. Some of you parents on YouTube are dealing with drunkenness. You think you're not an alcoholic because you may only drink one drink a day or one drink a week or whatever. You may not get totally drunk. But what you don't realize is most children who are molested and raped are raped by adults who are under the influence of something other than themselves. That opens the door to all the possibilities of the works of darkness. And then when you come to yourself, you're horrified at what you did. But your inhibitions, your standards, all of those have been laid to the side because alcohol has calmed you down. Alcohol, drugs, anything that influences your judgment has calmed you down. So you're not caught up in your normal standards. You're not interested in the right or the wrong of it. What you are ingesting into your body is mind altering. And if it's mind altering, it alters the level of your judgment calls. And as a result, you commit, hmm, what's the word, incest. You commit rape. You commit levels of fornication that you may normally not have done if you were not under the influence. You allow children to do things to you and you do things to them that are totally inappropriate. But under the influence of the alcohol or the drug, or you allow somebody else to do something with your kids. Or you allow somebody else to do something to you. You know it's sick. But you want to be liked. It's really crazy how this goes. Drunkenness. Revelings. And such like. Of the which I tell you before. As I also have told you in time past. That they which do such 
things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So now with the works of the flesh, they are diametrically opposed to the works of God, the works of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to read the next few verses so you can see the contrast. But the Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, great goodness, faith. Let me go back to peace. If you're mellow as a cello and you're totally at peace and everything is copostatic with you, there is no room for panic. You know who your God is. You know how faithful he is. Why is it that every crisis that arises in your life, why must it be seen as a crisis? You, in your mind, walking with the Lord, can see the challenge as a crisis or you can see it as an opportunity. It depends on your perspective. Your perspective will determine how you respond, how it makes you feel. Hmm. Opportunity or crisis? Crisis or opportunity? Which is it for you? How long have you been walking with the Lord? And it's still a crisis with you? Take that back to the manufacturer. You may need a little overhaul or a little refurbi a little refurbishing. Mm -hmm. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. The same way that we should not allow flesh to be in control of our lives, lust to be in control of our choices, we, or, or alcohol or drugs to be in control of our judgment calls, we should n neither be any more given to fear. Fear is not of God. God is love. And perfect love casts out fear. Fear has torment. What does that mean? Fear is from the devil. So don't open your mouth wide and swallow the fear. It is not yours to eat. But once you choose to swallow it, trust me, you're going to panic. Just like Satan wants you to, you're going to hit the panic button. Because now you see yourself as being in a crisis. Rather than seeing it through the eyes of God's spirit as approaching an opportunity and wondering how is God going to do this one? Oh, this is, I'm going to sit back and watch this. Mm-hmm. Are you living your life through expectancy or are you living your life through dread? Oh, no! Not again! Oh, no! Not this! What am I going to do? Hmm. Sometimes when I counsel people on the phone and I hear them saying, Oh God, help me, help me Lord, help me Lord, help me Lord, help me. Sometimes I want to pop them upside the head and say, What do you think God is doing right now? It, it's like, it's, it's like having a spoon coming to your mouth. And you're saying, and it's full of food. And you're saying, Feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me. And all you got to do is open your mouth and the spoon comes in. But you're so busy saying feed me, the spoon can't get in your mouth for your much speech. Why do we do God that way? Walking with the Lord 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And every crisis is still a crisis rather than an opportunity. Where is your faith? Can you imagine if your 
husband, wife, child, friend, whatever, somebody you're close to, you tell them, I'm going to help you with this in about three days. So call me if you don't hear from me the night before, just to make sure I don't forget. Now you know that that person is a person of their word. You know it. So in your mind, ah, you can exhale. Oh, problem solved. Thank you, Lord. Oh, I thank you for this one. I thank you for that one. Thank you for their faithfulness. I know I can depend on them. Thank you, Lord, for blessing me through them. And then the night before comes and you call. Okay, so you did what you were supposed to do. But then the hours in the night start to draw closer. Now you're starting to worry. What are you worried about? You got their word. No, now you're worrying. What if they die? What if they empty their bank account? What if this happens? What if that happens? Oh no, oh no. I got to figure out what else to do. What am I going to do? Lord, help me. Help me, Lord. Lord, help me. Help me, Lord. And we don't realize we're all in the flesh when we're like that. That is not walking in the spirit. We're in the flesh. Mm, help me with this, Lord. Okay. Huh. <laughs> Ephesians 6, 13. Finally, my brethren, starting at verse 10, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, not your might, not your husband's might, not your girlfriend's might, not your wife's might, not your boyfriend's might. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. What cane are you leaning on? Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having a breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Not panic, peace. Above all, take the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench, put out all the fiery darts. Not some of the fiery darts, all of the fiery darts of the wicked. And yeah, there are going to be wicked folks coming up against you. Wicked folks talking about you behind your back. You may have been in their corner for years, but one little pimple or one little offense, and boy, you are the devil's child in their eyes, and everybody that hears about you is going to hear what a horrible person you've turned out to be. Because people turn on you. That's just the way it is. People are fickle. But you cannot allow that to affect how you Live out your life. You cannot allow that to affect how you feel. So, let's go back to putting on the whole armor of God, shall we? Now, let's picture Lynn. I'm a, I like to pick on Lynn because she can take it. Let's picture Lynn. Let's say Lynn has, has run into a few obstacles too many. She is at her wit's end. She's angry. She's frustrated, she's disappointed, and she's disgusted. Think about that. Mm -hmm. Now, here we go. Check this out. She's disgusted, and she wants to throw up her hands and throw in the towel and just say, forget it, I give up. Mm-hmm. So now she slips into depression. Depression now. What happens when you start to get depressed? Because see, the fear of other disappointments cause you to park, pull over, 
put it in neutral or put it in park, you turn the engine off and you just say, forget it. I'm done. I'm done with this crap. Mm -hmm. That's what life can do to us if we approach life in the flesh. So what ends up happening? She knows to put on the whole armor of God, but she doesn't feel like it. Because right now she feels like she's got the right to be sour. She's got the right to be angry. So, what I want to say to many of you, I'm painting a picture so you can see. That's not what Lynn is doing. I'm painting a picture. When you feel like life has got you at your wit's end, and you don't know what else to do, and you're backed up against the wall, and you feel like throwing in the towel and giving up. Remember what that is. That's the spirit of depression. And when you look at a lot of infomercials on TV or the internet or whatever, and they begin to describe what it feels like to go through depression, what you're giving into is something that makes you not want to even put your clothes on and go out the door. You want to stay in the house. You want to stop the world so you can get off. So you stay in your house. You can barely peep out the window and take in the rays of the sun. Why? You want to dark. Close the curtains. Close the blinds. Leave me alone. Don't call me. Don't talk to me. Don't knock on my door. No, I don't want to eat. That's why the Bible says put on the whole armor. Because if you're not getting dressed in the spirit, baby, that can happen to anybody. And you will not only give up on the world, you will not only give up on yourself, you will not only give up on your friends, you will give up on God. And when you give up on God, you are a sitting target for Satan. He can jerk you around anywhere he wants to. And now you become his puppet and he's your puppeteer. And everything you do, everything you think, everything in your flesh comes from the flesh. I mean, everything you feel comes from the flesh. Senior moment, y'all. I'm going to be 68 tomorrow. Remember that. Anyway, so when you're going through life, you have to remember to differentiate between what is spirit? What is a crisis? What is an opportunity? Where does your faith lie? What choices are you going to make? How are you going to determine what your next move is? Is it going to be based on, Ooh, baby, I need a little something, something. Or is it going to be based on, Lord, take me above my flesh. Is it going to be based on prayer? Is it going to be based on God's ability and authority over your flesh? Because see, the hard part with a lot of us is when we go through life, we want to be rescued. And the reason we want to be rescued is because sometimes we don't feel like going through the battle. Now, when you go through the battle, you forget that the battle is not yours in the first place. The Bible says the battle is the Lord's. All you have to do is show up fully dressed, fully armored, fully equipped. What's one of the armors? The Word of God. And some of y'all won't even read that. So you want to be rescued, but you don't want to make that stand. See, let's take this down to a basic physical example. All right. If I want to lay down in the bed and wallow in depression, if I want to give up on everything and not put forth any effort, I can sleep and sleep and sleep and just get all into my dreams. That's not my reality, but I'm into my dreams, doing my thing. Mm -hmm. But when God says, get up, you got to, it takes effort to roll out that bed, get yourself ready, 
to push yourself up. Oh, you don't want to push yourself up. It takes too much effort. Forget it. Let me go back to sleep. Let me lay down again. I just, I'm tired. I don't, I don't feel like going anywhere. I don't feel like doing anything. I don't, I don't feel like fighting. I don't feel like struggling. I don't feel like, guess what? I don't care if you walk with God or if you don't, baby cakes. Life is a struggle. So no matter what you do, you cannot run and you cannot hide. What God is, is our buffer. God is the wheel that gets you there instead of your feet. God softens the blows and shows you all kind of detour routes to avoid many more obstacles that you would have to face without him. Once you learn who God is in your life, crisis will change to opportunity. Half empty will change to half full or almost full. Because of your perspective, you can lay there and live a life of paralysis or you can stand. And when you've done all to stand, stand. Having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Taking the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Word of God is your sustenance. The Word of God will open your eyes to things known and unknown, things seen and unseen. The Word of God will strengthen you on the inner man. The Word of God will make an ugly day and turn it into an amazing day because even though things went wrong, it didn't affect you. Why? Because if you keep your mind stayed on Him, He will keep you in perfect peace. So you don't have to go to the bottle which alters your mind and your judgment calls and makes you do things that horrify you. You don't have to go to idol worship, which causes you to back up from people when you should go forward and confront some things and discipline some situations. You don't have to live in fear. You can speak your mind and not worry about retaliation. Because who is your defense attorney? God. And I'm going to close with the opening scripture I, I opened with. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God bless you to live out your life on God's word, on God's truth with God's power, with His Holy Spirit working in you, with your mind stayed on Him, filled with His peace, His love, everything that goes with the package of walking with the Lord. And may your life be blessed. And may all your crises turn out to be opportunities rather than a pitfall. Amen? God bless you.